So, ladies and gentlemen, if I can, uh, if I can have your attention, would like to welcome you all to this discussion of uh, of the latest QDDR. Um, very pleased to be able to host this uh, here at the Institute of Peace. Uh, I'm Bill Taylor. I'm the acting executive vice president uh, at the moment, and I'm very pleased to be able to have you all here. Um, I was noticing on the list of uh, RSVPs that there are some of you who were here a year ago um, when Congressman Perriello started this thing with Kristen, uh, Kristen Lord, uh, my predecessor. Um, and I see some people, uh, I recognize the people who were here. And uh, you know who you are. And thank you for coming back, uh, Rick. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, we um, are very pleased uh, to have this team here. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Rick Barton, who I've already recognized, Ambassador Barton, who was the former Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization, which was created in the previous uh, QDDR. So, Rick, glad you're here. Um, is Barbara Bourdain here, Ambassador Bourdain? No. no she, oh, yes, Barbara Bourdain is here. Ambassador Bourdain, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. It's glad to have you. Uh, she's now the director of Georgetown University's Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. And so we're very, it's, it's, uh, it's appropriate. Ambassador O'Donnell is here, I saw earlier. Very glad to have you, sir. Um, uh, who is advising diplomatic security. Um, and so we're, we're pleased uh, to have you here as well. Ambassador Thorne is Ambassador David. This is right here, right in front of me. Thank you, David. Welcome, Ambassador Thorne. That's the uh, senior advisor to the Secretary to Secretary Kerry. So we're very glad to have you. Adam Riggs, I can see other name tags here, and I will just uh, acknowledge that there are a lot of people from across the street, um, as well as from the non-governmental community that are here, as well as a good number of people, my colleagues here from USIP. I'm glad to, to, to have you, George, and Peter, and team. Andrew, I saw Andrew here, that's good. So welcome all of you um, to, to this. We are very pleased to have this opportunity to talk through the, the quadrennial diplomacy, uh, although Alex says uh, development and diplomacy, whatever, one way or the other, QDDR. <laughs> <coughs> and, and we have Ambassador Tom Shannon, Counselor of the Department of State, who is here. Susan Reichley, Counselor to the Acting Administrator. Um, New administrator name today, everybody in this room knows, I'm sure, very pleased. Congressman Tom Perio, I've already mentioned, and Alex Thier, assistant administrator for USAID Bureau of Policy Planning and Learning, whom the USAID stole from us, I will just say. Uh, he was here um, as the head of our Afghanistan. He was actually Andrew Wilder's predecessor, and so uh, he was, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Your colleagues have thanked me as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what they say. <laughs> um, so, we, as I say, we're very pleased to have started this uh, a year ago. Very pleased, uh, Congressman, to have you back and, and to describe this with, with your colleagues. Um, it's written to the QDDR course, it's written to give guidance to the diplomats and the development professionals um, as they do their work, but it's also of great interest to peace builders. Um, in particular, the USIP community, there's a big overlap, but obviously, between the development diplomacy um, and, and looking for peaceful resolution of disputes, which is what we do here. Um, before we, let's see, um, before, we'll hear from the panel, um, and we'll have a bit of a time for discussion, um, and then we would love to have your questions, in particular that from George Ingram, who says he's got very difficult questions for all of you here. That's what he told me just before. I'm sorry, we've run out of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, um, so I'd like to introduce the first speaker for today, Congressman Tom Perdell, I've already mentioned, it represented uh, Virginia in Congress, special advisor to the prosecutor of a special court for, in, uh, for Sierra Leone, CEO of the Center for American Progress Action Fund, um, and he has worked and conducted research in a dozen countries, taught courses on transitional justice at the University of Virginia, Virginia School of Law and the University of Sierra Leone. This is on the record, and we are live streaming, I'm told, um, so with that, Congressman, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really cannot say enough about the partnership with the U.S. Institute of Peace. 
um, on ideas and substance most of all, uh, but also on logistics. Uh, it has been uh, a lot of work to get uh, this launched together. But again, from beginning to end, as you noted, uh, we have worked closely with USIP, with many of the foreign policy experts in this room, uh, some of whom uh, submitted extremely thoughtful uh, ideas to us, and we met regularly with outside experts as well as experts throughout the building. So uh, it really has, we have tried to do, uh, cast a wide net on that, and I think it will be, uh, I think it is reflected in the report. Uh, this is, in fact, the report, uh, though I will let you know this is technically a galley's copy. Uh, the 15 were made um, because uh, we needed them to hold up at launch, but the actual reports uh, will be out. We, we thought about spinning it as a desire for paperless uh, uh, reporting, but uh, in fact, the reports will come. But we're very excited, and the Secretary launched this with Deputy Secretary Higginbottom, who co-chaired this process with um, first Raj Shaw and then Acting Administrator uh, Linhart um, the other day. Um, we were actually managed uh, to trend on DC Twitter on Tuesday night, which is pretty odd for a quadrennial review, I will say. Uh, and again on Wednesday when there was a tweet back and forth between Secretary Clinton and Secretary Kerry online. So it's been lighting up social media uh, <laughs> <clears throat> since the report, um, and we're excited about that. Let me just go through a few uh, top lines, because there's a lot of brain power in this room, and I think it'll work best as an exchange. Um, and say a little bit about the four strategic uh, priorities that are outlined at the beginning, and then a little bit about how we thought of this in terms of internal reforms. Um, the Secretary felt the last, the first QDDR, as it should be, was, it was comprehensive. Uh, it really covered everything, laid a foundation because it was first of its kind, uh, did a lot of reorganization of bureaus and other things. The Secretary felt like that was a process that was ongoing and wanted to run uh, a review that was focused on a few key priorities he felt had either shifted in the strategic landscape uh, or were in related to internal capabilities that we needed to think about in a particular way. One uh, of the four, first, prevention of conflict and violent extremism, and I think it is fair to say the most relevant word here is prevention. Uh, we will continue to counter terrorism. That will continue to be something that uh, all agencies in the foreign policy uh, community are part of, uh, but that we need to continue to build capabilities emphasis on the issues of prevention. Uh, this includes better data and diagnostics, a theme we'll come back to several times on thinking about this, but we understand the difficulties of the draw to what is a1 above the fold, and how do we address these issues? Second, uh, a very strong um, lean in, I would say, on accountable and democratic governance. Um, uh, I was in a meeting earlier today where people said democracy really seems to be uh, on the rise in this report. Um, and I think that comes from an understanding that there has been a serious issue of closing spaces. Uh, we know civil society groups, many of your organizations face this, USAID, state faces this. We do believe the overall trend remains extremely promising in terms of a, a expansion of freedoms, but we understand there have been significant threats to that. There's also uh, a lot of attention paid to the issue of corruption, which came up a great deal throughout. Uh, corruption not just in a right space, but in a PVE space, in a barrier to inclusive economic uh, growth space. Um, inclusive economic growth is the third. Um, David Thorne, who runs the Shared Prosperity Agenda for the Secretary uh, in the State Department, um, uh, has certainly looked into this in terms of our own internal capabilities, uh, issues of economic uh, expertise in the department. But I also see this, and, and maybe Alex will speak to this, as being a convergence of sorts, where a Aid continues the march to eradicate extreme poverty, but is also looking at issues of social mobility more broadly in the full path into the global middle class. On the diplomacy side, uh, while we will continue to look at growth qua growth, there's an understanding that the inclusivity is crucial. Where you have radical inequalities or where you have real and perceived unfairness or corruption issues, uh, you can see instability and other factors grow. And then the fourth is climate change. Uh, this is obviously one of the great existential threats of our time. Um, but we are also seeing this as a chance to model a combination of the best of traditional diplomacy with next generation diplomacy, and Councillor Shannon will speak to this, with the fact that we need and it is absolute priority to lock down a traditional global multilateral agreement in Paris, but that can and must be complemented with reaching out directly to mayors, faith leaders, CEOs, and others to be parts of the solution in a world of diffuse power. I've probably already stretched my time, and I'm just getting to the uh, internal piece, so I'll just say three quick uh, overarching themes that we think ran throughout. And they were knowledge, engagement, and agility. 
when we thought about what the comparative advantages are for state and aid, uh, we think knowledge and direct engagement have been and remain two clear comparative advantages. And agility has always been a challenge and has become more so given issues of complex physical risk that many in our conversations at USIP wrote, uh, raised and elsewhere. On knowledge, uh, we must understand that in a current environment where we could benefit from the idea that we had a monopoly on large amounts of information, the amount of information we can hold in our institutions is tiny relative to the sheer amount of knowledge that is available in the world. We are looking at data, diagnostics, and design, and how that can be leveraged uh, in space, how we share that information and manage it, how we get uh, better diagnostics across. And we'll, we'll geek out on that a little bit in the answers, because I know George is going to ask about it. Um, on the engagement side, uh, we want to make sure we put a premium on getting our officers overseas, our development professionals overseas. We want to make sure they're spending time out side of embassy walls, <coughs> engaging directly with the people of those communities. That's what's made Ambassador Shannon the best in the business, is the ability to get out and know how to do this and how these communities work. Whether it's the tasking system or physical risk issues, we cannot undermine the very comparative advantage of our presence, which is engagement. And the last is agility and risk. And here, uh, there was a very strong consensus, particularly for many of the newer officers who've come in, uh, that we have to put the mission first. We must protect our people. But there's inherent risk in what we do. And we want to do this because people have signed up to serve their country in that way. So we will be smart about it. We will manage it. Uh, but we need to figure out, in a world that is very fast-paced, how to get the right people to the right posts with the right skill sets at the right moment. Certainly, Rick and others have been trailblazers on that. Um, and the last word within both the agility and the knowledge set, and then I will, will uh, pipe down for a bit, um, is the issue of uh, better flexibility for our officers over a career, whether that's in an economic cone, making sure that there's a deepening of economic training, better out tours and incentives for out tours, uh, incentives for making the senior foreign service to have done a tour through a functional bureau uh, or through an out tour or directly into the private sector, uh, which again, both Councilor Shannon and uh, uh, Ambassador Thorne have looked at in the state context. So lots of uh, nuggets to dig into there, but um, since there's a lot more wisdom on the panel, I will shush and say those are some of the, uh, some of the areas. And again, uh, a special thank you to everyone for, for their inputs. Congressman, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and so that's the first state uh, view and now the first USAID view, Alex Thier, whom I've already introduced, and uh, Alex, the floor is yours. Thanks, Bill. Um, it's always wonderful to be back home. Although I'm going to point out that despite the magisterial uh, surroundings, when when this was my home, we were in a building on 17th Street that was so dingy it was subsequently torn down. <laughs> um, uh, so I applaud your choice of uh, environs for your work. Um, you know, when I left USIP, uh, I would say that when you go into government, uh, which I did about five years ago, you envision the opportunity to do things like this, to simultaneously be able to step back and look at some of the biggest trends that affect us, what's working and what's not, um, how we enhance collaboration across the U.S. government and more broadly, um, and to have a serious amount of time and fantastic colleagues to do that with has been a real blessing and honor. And so it's a thanks to Tom, um, other colleagues uh, like Susan and Tom Shannon who sat with us on the executive committee, and then so many in the broader community who gave their time and input to help us through this process. Um, you know, this is an incredible year for us in development and at USAID. We are simultaneously just having launched a national security strategy from the White House, a QDDR. We are also embroiled right now in negotiating the outcome of the next financing for development agreement, which will define how development is financed and motivated and catalyzed over the next decade, the next round of sustainable development goals, which will define till 2030 the world's development goals, and a climate agreement in Paris. Uh, and that's honestly not everything that's on the agenda right now. There's also a World Humanitarian Summit, more trade negotiations. And so we're in this incredible moment. 
And I think that what we have tried to do, and hopefully you'll tell us if we have done in this QDDR, is really to speak to, uh, from the development perspective, where we have come that frankly gives us the capacity to step up and lead in this environment and how we're going to continue to reinforce some of the incredible development gains and changes that we've seen uh, over the last couple of years. Bill mentioned uh, that Gail Smith was nominated today by the president to be the next USAID administrator, and it's particularly poignant that Gail was really the both thought and process leader for the creation of the first ever presidential decision directive on development, which thanks to a FOIA request, despite our best efforts, is now available to the public. Um, and it reads beautifully. It reads like a manifesto, and it's something that I think is strongly reinforced in this document. Because when you look around the world and the four strategic pillars that are in this document, what you see is that development sits in many ways at the root of the challenges that the United States faces in the world today. And so two things that I really love about this document are one, that it continues to reinforce the centrality not of USAID or not of the State Department, but of development as a fundamental pillar of our national security and foreign policy objectives. And I think also pushes us to think about the ways in which not only our development spending, but our diplomacy and everything else is fundamental to the accomplishment of those goals. These four pillars that Tom already spoke to, to me, are this sort of powerful view of what's happening in the world today. On one hand, you have the most dramatic gains that really we've ever seen in the course of humanity over the last couple of decades in bringing people out of extreme poverty, providing access to resources, education, health care, um, so much so that we actually believe that it's a feasible to talk about the end of extreme poverty by 2030. Uh, but that requires inclusive economic growth. And that requires what we do across our government, focusing on trade, focusing on economic diplomacy, focusing on our investments like in agriculture and, and power, all of which are interagency investments. Um, it also requires fundamentally the focus on good governance. Because the one thing that we know from our experience is that the single most salient difference between the countries that succeed and those that fail is about governance. At the same time, what we also know is that there are things that really fundamentally stand in our path, and those are the other pillars of this document. It's about being able to address conflict, fragility, extremism, the things that undermine that progress, and at the same time ensuring that climate change does not send us backwards. Um, and that frame, for me, those four pillars really speak to, I think, collectively what our, our mission as USAID and more broadly, because we have this great <laughs> harmonic convergence in our goals uh, between state and aid, um, is really about. Um, the last thing that I will say, which is really important, because I think Tom and I, we got to travel a little bit together and this speaks to me really personally as somebody who spent a lot of time in failed and fragile states, is this issue of risk, whether it be physical risk or the ability to take risks in how we communicate and where we invest. Um, I had the personal experience when I was managing our work on Afghanistan of losing somebody uh, who worked uh, for USAID under my authority. Um, and that's a powerful experience that none of us ever want to go through. But the experience that I had that was replicated by conversations that we have had around the world is that our diplomats and our development experts go into this line of duty understanding that there are risks to be taken and believing in the project of American leadership and what good it can bring to the rest of the world. And that means they're willing to take on some of those risks. And so we have tried to take very seriously the idea of enabling and empowering our staffs around the world to be able to take risks 
and get their jobs done because they know that they're not just doing it for themselves, they're doing it for the greater good not only of our security and prosperity here at home, but frankly, uh, those of our partners as well. Alex, thank you very much. Um, we're going to come back this way. Um, so the, our next speaker is Ambassador Tom Shannon the counselor for the Department of State, career ambassador in the Foreign Service. Ambassador Shannon served for nearly four years as the U.S. Ambassador to Brazil, uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere uh, Affairs, among other posts, and we are very pleased that Ambassador Shannon's here. Sir. Uh, thank you very much, Bill. It's a great pleasure to be here and a real honor uh, to be sitting at the panel with everybody who did all the work. Uh, so, uh, and, and also to have a chance to have a conversation with all of you today, because this is obviously something that's very important to us. Although, um, if, uh, if I'd been asked, I would have taken issue with the QDDR in terms of its name, because a review means that you are looking at something again. It is a re-look at something, and I don't think there's anything re about this QDDR. It really is a look into the future uh, in a, a pretty dramatic and interesting way, and in a way that uh, the few first QDDR wasn't. The few first QDDR was really trying to get us straight institutionally for the challenges that we're facing. But I think what this QDDR is, is anticipate the world that is to come uh, and look into the 21st century and try to figure out what are the policy challenges we're going to face and how we get there. And for me, one of the most interesting and the most challenging for us has to do with climate change. Uh, and so I'll spend my few minutes talking about that because as the Secretary noted and as Deputy Higginbottom noted, noted the other day, one of the things we're going to be doing in, um, in because of the QDDR is looking at how we address climate change, not just at the national level, but at the subnational level. And by subnational level, we really mean municipalities. And using engagement in municipalities, as Tom noted, to reach out to corporations, uh, to faith-based uh, leaders and, and organizations, and all of the civil society and economic components of, of large municipalities. Uh, first and foremost, because uh, as we attempt to address global climate change through global agreements, uh, we are also realizing uh, that we can't be tethered uh, or, or limited by the pace of global agreements. And we have to look for ways to advance uh, on climate change issues as quickly and as smartly as possible. We've already showed that we can do this in our bilateral, bilateral agreement with China. Uh, and we think that we can find ways to incorporate work that's already being done uh, around municipalities and climate change by Mayor Bloomberg and others uh, and connect this to other um, <coughs> municipalities around the world that are looking for tool sets uh, and access to information that will allow them to begin to address uh, environmental sustainability uh, in an urban environment. Uh, and some of this goes back to work that began under Secretary Clinton uh, when um, the Special Envoy for Intergovernmental uh, relations. Rita Jo Lewis began negotiating a series of subnational dialogue agreements with countries like China and Brazil. Uh, but, but it also goes back to relationships that were built between State Department, EPA, our Department of Interior, and uh, uh, municipalities in the United States and outside the United States. And I had uh, the pleasure of working in one of these uh, efforts between Philadelphia and Rio something called the Joint Initiative on Urban Sustainability, or JUICE, which was all designed around helping municipalities exchange best practices uh, in both in development, construction, and job training to ensure that uh, lead technologies were being brought into cities and that workers were being trained to, to work and build with these kind of technologies as cities began to re rebuild themselves, which was something Philadelphia was going through and is something Rio was going through in the run-up to the 2016 uh, Olympic Games. And so I, I found in this uh, a really rich field of engagement that allowed uh, our embassy to to work uh, across communities where historically would not been present uh, and to do so in ways that were immediately relevant to the people we were working with. And so in this regard, I think we have an opportunity to open up a, a new vista of diplomatic activity uh, and to do it in ways that are going to bring in non-traditional partners, both on the U.S. side uh, and in the countries we're working with. And so I'm, I'm quite excited about this. I think this is uh, really innovative and important. And although it, it only f uh, figures in a small part of the text, uh, I think going forward, it's actually going to be a big part of what we do. So. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, Susan Reichley, last uh, but not least, uh, <laughs> introduces Reichley Counselor to USAID, 
Prior to her position there, she served as assistant, assistant to the administrator for policy, planning, and learning. So we have that well that office well represented here today. And before <laughs> that, as the deputy coordinator in the former office of the coordinator for reconstruction and stabilization at the State Department. Um, and she served in Colombia, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Russia, where I first met Susan That's many right. years ago. And uh, we are delighted to have you. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to USIP and Bill for hosting all of us today and for all of you being here. I know I'm sort of the wrap up before we get into discussion, which is really what we want is a conversation about the QDR. But I did want to make a couple points from the start. I mean, first, uh, there's always going to be discussion of does a QDR matter? And I had the good fortune of uh, living through and experiencing and participating heavily in the first QDR. Uh, and so I can say from that experience, four and a half years ago to what we've accomplished, all of us over, and I say all of us in the community who work in foreign affairs from diplomacy to development, a lot has been done. And as Tom said, that was sort of our chance to really restructure, get it right for us in the development community. Um, as uh, our former deputy administrator said last week at CSIS, uh, you know, USAID was really eviscerated. And when we had the presidential policy, uh, uh, um, PPD6, the global development policy, that was our vision, but the QDDR was our playbook. And if you look at what we've all accomplished over the last, um, last you know, almost five years in really bringing development on par with diplomacy and making it core to our national security and our foreign policy, uh, I think there's a lot that's been accomplished uh, from obviously having a much more evidence-based, uh, transparent, as George would want to remind us, a decision-making process so that we can make the best decisions make it moving forward from transparent strategies to obviously evaluations that really help us make the changes that are absolutely critical to delivering the results on on the ground for the people we serve, but also, most importantly, as well, for the American people. So a lot was accomplished. But now, moving forward, this really provides us an opportunity, and under Tom's incredible leadership, uh, to, to have us look forward. What are the biggest challenges? And you've had a chance to already hear from the panelists, so I'm not going to reiterate what they said, but there's two things I wanted to highlight. One thing that we signaled in the first QDDR was obviously preventing and responding to conflict and crisis in a better way. Um, and that led to a lot of things and changes, including obviously standing up CSO and, and how we really looked at prevention. But what you clearly see in this QDDR is a much more forward-leaning uh, and aggressive approach to mitigating and preventing violent extremism. And as we know, and particularly what uh, we've all experienced over the last year, we need to increase our capabilities. And that's ultimately what a QDDR is about. It's about how do we look at these challenges and how do we use the best and the brightest of our capabilities that exist with, both within the department and within USAID and with the development community with all of you so that we can tackle this. And as we've learned over the years, obviously violent extremism is, is very complex. And I think uh, clearly the literature shows that just attacking it with development is not enough. We have to understand what are the drivers of violent extremism. And I'm so pleased pleased to see some of the authors of the policy that we issued a couple years ago that really tried to take the thinking forward. And now we have to put the organizational capabilities behind that. And as you saw in the President's Summit back in February, which had 65 ministers come together, but we know that this is not just a government uh, challenge. This is a whole of society challenge. So he brought together, obviously, members of civil society as well as the private sector, media, and got all of us together for four days, really looking at this challenge and what are the capabilities that we need in order to address it. So that's the first thing I just want to highlight. The second thing is something that Alex touched on very eloquently regarding risk. And that was something I think the team, the QDDR team, took, uh, a, again, a very forward-leaning uh, approach to and, and we greatly appreciate it, I know, within USAID, that we weren't just looking at physical risk, which is often the risk that's defined, but looking at the programmatic risk, at the reputational risk, at how do we deliver 
on our promise of development, on our promise of diplomacy, in order to do the best work possible for the American people. And so I'm really thrilled to see that in this QDDR, it commits us uh, not just to working internally to look at how do we redefine risk and how do we tackle some of these challenges to in order to ensure our diplomats and our development professionals can get beyond the wire, can really do evidence-based uh, work on the ground to deliver, but it's a dialogue with all of you so that we can come up with the flexibilities and the most forward-leaning approaches that we, um, we possibly can. So I think this is the start of a dialogue. It's not the end. A lot of tremendous work went into this, but uh, look forward to working with all of you on these issues and more. Thank you, Susan. Beginning of the dialogue. That's a good uh, uh, introduction to this part of the conversation. So now that you have heard for half an hour now from this group, um, I would love, and I think they would love, <laughs> to hear from you your questions, your observations, thoughts on uh, on this QDDR or the past one as it leads up into this one. Yes, George. Good for you. Good for you. And I try to convince him that if he addressed you as representative, it would catch your former position and your current position. <laughs> but he couldn't find that in the diplomatic playbook. Like many times, I have not taken George's advice. <laughs> Usually you were correct. Um, and, and let me surprise you. But no, first of all, let me commend you for conducting a truly transparent, open, consultative process, uh, which I believe is a model for the way the U.S. government should develop policy. So thank you. And I thank you and your colleagues for that. Um, but let me get off my normal hobby horse and talk about another interest, which is the QDDR nicely talks about <coughs> democracy, economic inclusion, fragility, and where it brings those together in several places, one place, is it talks about and references the New Deal for Fragile States. Um, over the last year, there have been at least four studies I know of, which have all come to the conclusion that none of the parties are <coughs> devoting to the New Deal the commitments that either the donors or the pilot countries committed to under the structures of the New Deal. Um, I'm gonna take the reference to the New Deal in the QDDR as an indication that it is something that you all think is an important structure, um, is a way for the U.S. and other countries to move ahead in trying to move countries to political, economic, social resilience, and wonder from you or Susan or Alex as to whether or not there's something behind that and deeper than what we see on paper as to how we might move ahead on the New Deal. Well, I'm going to let you guys take first shot, and then I might make a point behind it. Um, well, you know, actually, there's something that Susan and I have both done a bunch of work on, and I, I think that everybody, as you have indicated from the things that you're reading, uh, and Melissa is sitting next to you, um, <laughs> everybody is looking at whether this structure works. Um, the reason that we endorse it strongly in the national security strategy in the QDDR is because I think the New Deal fundamentally recognizes some shortcomings in the way that we have approached addressing fragile states, and we are still trying to figure out how to strengthen that framework, but it really captures a couple of really important things uh, that sit at the heart of where I think many of us, and you're sitting in USIP and mm -hmm. You know, this building is devoted to writing lessons learned about fragile states' experiences. Um, the need for a mutual compact, commitments that are both political as well as economic, in order to address the underlying causes of the reason that you're having the discussion in the first place is fundamental. That's not going to go away, and I think that the way in which the New Deal talks about that and then translates it into this thing called a compact is important and needs to be reinforced. The second thing is that we all know that we as donors uh, and the outside need to be a more effectively coordinated 
Um, many of us sitting in this room have had the experience of sitting in the finance minister's office. That's well, probably where I first met Bill. Uh, uh, sitting in the finance minister's office in a row of donors and who's next going in to talk about their own program. It doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work as well as it needs to. And mandating uh, both normatively and actually the type of cooperation and coordination among donors is, is absolutely fundamental. I think we've seen that it has had shortcomings so far in the implementation. So I believe that our speaking to it is recognizing that it still really matters to us as a structure and what it, the underlying challenges that it recognizes. Uh, and then specifically, and you see this in here, there is a process that is being undertaken within our government to think about how we as a government can work better and more effectively on these things doing conflict assessments together in a way that cuts across even more Ds than represented at this table um, is absolutely important. Thinking about, we'll talk about this probably for eternity, but thinking about flexible funding, flexible ways in which we can get people into the field quickly to deal with challenges, it's not something that we will forever solve, but that we need to be more effective at doing. And I think that we have recognized in this document after the good work done in the last one, that there are further steps that we can take to, to continue that. Yeah, and I would just, uh, we'll go on. So I, I was just gonna say more generally, I think there is an effort and, and enthusiasm and it's been getting piloted in the last uh, few years to find places where we can actually put together solid diagnostics that give us a framework. Every country is going to be um, uh, going to have their own dynamics. And one tiny little model of this that partially came out of the QDDR that just this week that's been fun is getting a group of people from state over to USAID looking at constraints to growth models. So here on a different issue, uh, um, we're, we, we don't want to have sort of the, what I've joked is this sort of Stephen Colbert truthiness approach to what's actually the barrier to constraints to growth. There are diagnostics, there's data, we want to do that. Um, as I said to, to someone yesterday in the group, and I don't think they took it well, but I meant it well, um, this QDDR is not quite a geek insurgency, but it is geek empowerment um, in the sense that for those people doing some of the data science, for those people who want to find a framework in these places and turn best practices, you're always going to want a chief of mission to, all, uh, to ultimately use the wisdom test. That's the experience that n cannot be recreated anywhere else. Um, but it should also be, it can still be informed by data and diagnostics. You need the ground truth, you need the wisdom, but in many of these cases, the idea it was a metaphor because state and aid actually did work really well together in this process. So here you have something that's inclusive economic growth oriented, it's data and diagnostic oriented, and it's state and aid trying to learn from each other in the process. And so I think it's not going to be a seismic shift overnight, but I think that's the kind of thing with the new model, the new deal and others uh, that, that will be a, playing a bigger role. Good. Did you have a, another question? Yeah, okay. Oh, good, good, good. All right. A new topic. That's a good Ah, thanks. Uh, Rebecca Zimmerman from RAND. Um, so uh, one of the things reading this that strikes me that, that I'm <laughs> thrilled about is that the, this QDDR talks not only about risk mitigation, as we've discussed, but what I see as being kind of the other side of that coin, which is staff care and you know, uh, making sure that the people who serve us, our country in the most dangerous places get the highest quality of care. And one of the things that I sort of have an, a, a question about um, is as we're thinking about both of these issues, risk mitigation and staff care, um, you know, there, there are places in the QDDR where we talk about sort of the larger family of state and aid as inclusive of contractors, local hires, and so forth. So how, how much can the QDDR do to affect the reality for risk and for care for those, those communities that are not permanent federal hires? You're going to have several people want to come in on this. Uh, Susan, you want to start? Sure. Yeah, this is an issue we've been deeply concerned about it at USAID, as they, I know they have been at the department, because the world we're working in now is vastly different than when I joined up 25 years ago. And um, clearly, the stress that we're not only uh, putting on our foreign service officers, but obviously our foreign service nationals, our partners, putting them in harm's way, obviously, in a much more direct way than we have um, in, in the past. We we 
need to really look at these issues. So one of the things, and you saw it signaled in the QDDR um, when we talk about non-permissive environments. So we've gone through a very lengthy diagnostic over the last year and working closely with our colleagues in the State Department uh, for us to designate 18 countries as countries that are non-permissive, not just for security reasons. It could be because of poor infrastructure, because of really an inability to get out into some of the most difficult parts of the country, um, just really challenging environments to work in. And so what we've done and uh, is to put together an entire program now that is dedicated to working in these 18 countries. And that means everything from not just policy guidance and training and tools, but bringing them here to Washington, having them go through a three-day intensive training on these issues for, such as staff care, as well as for the families, because the toll it's taking on our families and the assessments that we've done, we have right now a nine-month assessment that's coming to a close, and we finally have the data on what has been the impact of the last decade on, on our agency in particular, and a commitment, and particularly by our acting administrator, um, Al Lenhard, who's really been committed to the, making these reforms moving forward. And, and that's part of it, then, with the risk assessment, as we're working with our colleagues in State Department, then what, what does the data tell us? Where are the greatest uh, challenges for our staff? How do we move it to the field? And most importantly, how do we involve the entire community so that we can do better? Because uh, the risks aren't getting any lighter, and the environment is probably going to more, be more complex than less complex. Just a very quick note on that. Um, particularly the leadership of Deputy Secretary Higginbottom, who's really focused on wellness and health issues in this context. And it, uh, I've been informed in part, I did get to serve on the Veterans Affairs Committee, that we have learned lessons. We've learned lessons from not doing this well enough about this needing to start before people go uh, out into these environments, care while they're there, and care when they return. Also, beyond the permissive environment issue and the risk issue, um, just looking at, at the f the <laughs> diplomacy and diplomatic family in a way. Uh, so the issue of professional spouses uh, has, has come up a lot, whether that's as a tandem couple or whether that's uh, another career and some of the leave without pay opportunities, um, expansions and, and other issues are meant to reflect the fact that, uh, that, that we're in that kind of environment and want to be uh, thinking of care and broadly speaking. And again, the Deputy Secretary has done a lot of work in that area. Good. Uh, I'm going to come over here where there was uh, Jim Jir. Thank you so much. I'm Jim Shear at the Wilson Center, and congrats to this team for a terrific rollout, and also to USIP for bookending this process of the from start to finish. It's been great. Um, just, I'm thinking, if I'm looking back 50 years ago, diplomats would be scratching their head wondering what's going on here, and I think that's great. I mean, I think there's a lot of new themes and issues that really go to the future. It's, it's a very future-oriented, which uh, is terrific. Two very sort of narrowish questions. Uh, first of all, budgetary impact. I mean, what will folks, uh, Hill appropriators, be looking at, especially when you talk about a more skilled, diverse workforce uh, with greater opportunities for in career education, for tours out of the building? Are you looking for a float? Uh, I mean, that's, that's a real thing, uh, but very important, absolutely. And secondly, um, Regarding that uh, third D across the river, uh, do you guys have a short elevator speech in terms of how the third D can best support and help and enhance what you're trying to do with these two Ds? Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Who wants that? Yeah. <laughs> so on the budget uh, issue, I'll start there. Uh, one of the selling points to me, uh, not that I needed a selling point to become, to take the QDDR job, but uh, um, was the fact that it was co-located under the Deputy Secretary for Management and Resources. Um, policy and planning was certainly very involved uh, on both the state and the aid side, um, but, the, but the idea here is this should inform budget. It's not a budget document per se. But what I think we saw was that these were conversations going on at the same time and in the same with the same set of actors. So as we were finding, getting findings from the field, we're reporting those in real time to the co-chairs um, on both the state and the aid side and to the executive committee as we're forming proposals that's reflecting what's going forward with the budget process, et cetera. The secretary said early on, and I think it was right, we didn't want to come out with a document that says, um, 
well, if we only had more money, we would do all these things. Um, on the other hand, if we only had more money, there were there are really some things we would like to do and be able to do. Uh, and increasing capabilities is difficult. Uh, the Washington Post piece uh, snarkily or wittily uh, dealt with that issue today, and it's the QDDR is the most depressing document I've read uh, article, if you saw that. Um, and, uh, and so I think that those issues are real on the budget side. Um, and I think that uh, there, there is an ongoing effort, obviously, to, to deal with how those investments are made. We do not see a whole lot of things in the world that we can stop doing. Um, we certainly looked for those. Um, but, uh, but we remain the go-to uh, in these areas. So I think in the budget sense, it's a really healthy dialogue between the budget process, the management process. We're going to be putting together implementation guidance here uh, over the weeks ahead. Um, and I think that's how that'll work. Alex. Um, just to quickly answer the, the DOD question, oh, yeah. um, you know, I think that what we've found where we do it, that a joined up understanding of the underlying causes and consequences of political and development and humanitarian um, impacts or the situation in those environments can and should deeply inform how DOD also not only deploys its resources, but even designs its resources and thinks about where it should be and what it should be focusing on. We've actually lived this very powerfully this year in thinking about how do we look at places like the Sahel, uh, places where there are challenges of rising extremism, but that we clearly know that underlying causes have to do with other things. And our ability to share data, to do joint assessment, to talk about effective institution building, the importance of governance, and some of these long-term trends, um, I think is, is, you know, then really makes it a 3Ds enterprise. And so I think as we've talked about how we improve our own assessments and understanding of what we do and how we engage that, um, having the Department of Defense as a full partner in that process is obviously critical. And Bill? Uh, yeah, please. If, if I could just add, I mean, one of the, for me, as I noted, one of the striking things about uh, the QDDR is that it's really us on our tippy toes, uh, kind of looking at the horizon and trying to look beyond it. And so the head scratching is not just going to come from diplomats 50 years ago. It's going to come from lots of people as they, as they try to understand uh, what it is we're talking about. And it really is the, the world we're moving into. And so um, we're going to have to do a lot of outreach and a lot of educating and, and sharing our, our ideas about, you know, what it is we see coming at us and what we're going to need to get this done. Good. Uh, right here, and then you know, one and two. Thank you. Hi there. I'm John Glenn with the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. And congratulations, guys. You made it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to um, indeed commend your outreach and, of course, add one of the pieces from the sort of template of the QDDR, certainly to encourage and hope that you'll be doing this to engage Congress. I think that they need to hear it. There's a lot here that they will like. And I think it's an important piece to that and would be interested, you know, quickly in passing in your thoughts on that. But I'd like to pick up on one of the themes in there about partnerships and it ties in with budgets. I mean, on the one hand, we're looking in a world of limited budgets. We're not expecting anytime soon to see new budgets. But on the other hand, we're seeing a change in the world, which you all know and have said in other places in the developing world, rather than the 80% of all capital flows that official development use assistance used to be, it's now 10% which just changes the world in which what official assistance or public monies can and should do. This document talks a lot about partnerships, and there are a lot of terrific examples in the New Alliance for Food Security and Power Africa, but I'd be interested in your thoughts from the inside a little bit about how you're thinking about taking what are a number of fabulously successful examples that can sometimes seem like one-offs. How are you thinking about making this how you do business today? <laughs> Sure. Uh, so the Hill relationship has been a constructive one. In fact, we did a conference call right after the launch, and not a single person raised the issue of why didn't you talk to us about the report, which I took as a, a victory. I'm sure that'll come out later. But uh, we did engage a lot, and it's an important dialogue. And the Secretary specifically had in the report the idea that he wants to have a direct dialogue with the Hill on the risk question. Um, this has got to be a joint uh, decision in a democracy between those elected, those running state, about 
these questions. They're, they're sensitive questions. They need, it needs to be a transparent dialogue, uh, and they need to be partners on that. We've, we've talked in a way about how the last QDDR focused on whole of government, and this QDDR focused on whole of America. When you think about the relative amount of U.S. government power in the world, um, there has been a rise of the rest. And we need to keep in mind that that's a positive story. That was kind of the point all along from 1945 forward was that the greatest generation said, we want to bring other nations up. We want them to share in collective security. So that rise of the rest is part of the grand strategy that has existed for uh, for over 70 years. Um, however, it complicates the ways in which we, we uh, operate into these partnerships. Um, on the other hand, America, if you take it as a whole, the fullness of our financial power, our cultural power, um, you know, the, the, the reach of people, NGOs, et cetera, um, it really is just phenomenal to think about how much influence we as an entirety of people have uh, around. So we do want to think about how we leverage these things. The challenge we have, and we've talked about this in conversations, is what I sometimes call the um, spinach versus donuts problem, which is that we are often going into countries and saying, we will give you a relatively small amount of money in exchange for extremely strict rules, which I happen to think are good ones. No corruption, you have to be transparent, uh, you can't. You should use clean energy, um, et cetera, et cetera. These are rules that I like in place. There are other people now offering more money with fewer restrictions. And so I think at the end of the day, our policies are good ones in that we are asking people to eat spinach, right? Uh, you want good governance, you want uh, sustainability, but it is not always the most attractive choice set. So as we think about these partnerships and how we leverage this, we must realize there's an actual battle of ideas going on in some of this space. And it's not just about leveraging power, but it's about the fact that we are committed to a belief in an open global rules-based system and talking about why that's under threat and why that's a value going forward. Yeah, just to add to that, John, and I think that those are great points. I, I mean, clearly the first Q to DR, we laid out the commitment to partnership and, you know, s clearly signal science, technology, and innovation, what today now is born as the Global Development Lab, were are very important in order to move the me needle on not just development, but diplomacy and how to use it effectively. I think what's different and getting back to the capabilities, it, as you said, how are these not one-off things? That, yes, it's great that the Ebola Grand Challenge ended up in uh, you know a wedding dress maker in Baltimore who partnered with John Hopkins to come up with a more uh, efficient Ebola suit and that's a nice story but how do you actually partner in a way that does really lead to big results because it's not about us it's not about ODA anymore and I think one of the things that this QDR really does is lay out those capabilities so that it, it does get into the DNA that we have the flexibility and I'll just give you know the Development Innovation Accelerator that enables us to partner in a way so that, as Tom said, uh, they actually uh, do need to look at our rules and our regulations and the things that we strive for, but we're a partner as opposed to a donor. And that dramatically changes the relationship. And that's how we're looking at our roles now. And with our new Foreign Service officers and new officers, we've hired over a thousand people over the last four years coming into USAID, getting them to think about their role differently in partnership. and and to change, change that dynamic, so. Good, good, thank you both. Um, back here. David Reed, the World Wildlife Fund. I cannot help but echo the compliments that have given to Tom and the team for the inclusiveness and the recognition of non-state actors and partnerships and forging this, this new vision for our overseas engagements, no? Um, I pick up very much the newness, the, the richness, as Ambassador Shannon has done, the, the new dimension of climate change that has been added to this. I can't help but then pick up, Alex, your comment that we do, we recognize the impacts of climate change. We do not want them to undermine that our other three strategic priorities. And yet, in reading the document, which has been superficial on my part so far, the linkages among the four are very weak. And in fact, the, the truth is that the changes that we are experiencing today are at a pace, they're absolutely numbing. We cannot understand. If, just look at what the role of water scarcity in the Syrian civil war. Look at what's happening on our border. Look at what NASA just said about the mega drought 2050. Well, I just got back from San Antonio in the Midwest, and this is not a 2050 mega drought. We are in it. We're at the cusp of it, and this is being repeated around the world. As I look to your answers and how to address that, I turn to the part on the hub, data collection, 
And I, I congratulate you. I think this is absolutely fundamental. The challenge I believe that you face, one is not just uh, beginning to make the linkages among these four strategic pillars, but also how are you going to interpret and analyze that data? The data sources are exceptionally rich, whether private sector, whether it's Cargill, ABM, Mars, whoever, it's there. But how are you going to integrate it and interpret it, analyze it, and share it so that there is a coordinated response across our government to these challenges that we can't understand. Uh, it's a great, slightly depressing, but great question. Um, I actually wanted to pause for one second because I do not want to forget that there are, there are two people in this room uh, for whom, uh, without whom we would not have a QDDR. Um, and the even funnier part of that story is that after the QDDR, hopefully, um, they will continue as great partners with each other, and that is Caroline Wadhams and Noam Unger, um, who, if you don't know them, um, are wonderful, fantastic individuals in their own right. They are also a couple. Um, and they really helped uh, keep us all together, literally and uh, and figuratively. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I really wanted to make sure that we acknowledge the the incredible contribution that you two made. I think that the, you know, yes, with your children, do you still have them? Are they? Um, the, um, you know. In the fall, uh, the President Obama issued an executive order um, that uh, I think is actually about to become uh, a model for a number of other countries as well, uh, which requires us to look at all of the investments that we make across the board as a government um, and the impact that they have on climate. Um, and it's, it is the similar sort of mental shift that we actually made a few years ago um, on gender to make sure that this deep-rooted fundamental aspect that really in many ways affects everything we do and our goals uh, becomes a part not just of some sideline thing, uh, to your point about making sure it's integrated across the agenda, but that it actually is the agenda um, and that it's integral to everything that we do. And just to pick up on what Susan said, you know, we, um, it, 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 when you look at the big things that we are doing, um, when you look at Feed the Future and our investments in agriculture, uh, we are looking at agriculture not just as a way to feed people, but as a way to protect the planet, ensuring that everything from water resources to fertilizer um, are a fundamental part of the way we think about this because we know that they, that in order to feed the planet and the nine billion people we're gonna have, um, it, that, that this is fundamental uh, to not undermining our goals. Uh, the Global Development Lab, um, is undertaking a grand challenge that's looking at things like water desalination um, because we all know that water is, is going to be a driver for years to come. As Tom already mentioned, um, our focus on municipalities is very deeply tied with the understanding that some of the world's greatest cities, whether they're New York um, or um, in other parts of the world, um, are going to be and already are deeply affected by climate change and there is no path to sustainable development for people and planet that doesn't have us thinking about those things. Um, and so I, I think we have tried to think hard about the ways in which it impacts not only our grand strategic thinking but specifically the investments that, that we're going to be making. If I could just jump on that for a second, in return, in regards to climate change in cities, I mean, it's a great question. How do you integrate this stuff? How, how do you connect it all? Um, and for me, one of the, the exciting things about looking at, at climate change and working with cities is that we're connecting our climate change agenda with a governance agenda. Uh, and so it, to a certain extent, we're kind of linking on the ground. Uh, because as uh, the mayor of Philadelphia, uh, when we were doing um, the joint initiative for urban sustainability, uh, Mayor Nutter used to tell me, every mayor is an environmentalist. Uh, because every mayor has to address sustainability issues. Uh, and as we uh, get deeper into this, I think we're going to learn that municipalities can be a really interesting place to integrate all the themes of the QDDR, whether it's countering violent extremism, whether it's governance issues, whether it's inclusive economic growth, uh, and you can do it in a, in, in a, a single place uh, with a variety of actors. So this could be a very interesting diplomatic experiment for us.
you. Hi, uh, Alex Tierski at the Congressional Research Service, but more importantly, I think, friend to Noam and Caroline. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to make three quick points. The, the, the very first is, is I, I really commend the very strong statement in this document on risk acceptance, both physical and otherwise. I think that's a message that's going to go over very well in the Hill, and I haven't seen that expressed as strongly anywhere else uh, from the department in particular. So I, I, I really commend that, that statement. There have been already a, a few questions on resources from the Hill, but no one's asked yet how this might dovetail with the really interesting discussion that's going on on foreign relations authorization. And it was much clearer where the last QDDR might need some new authorities. It's not clear to me that this one has anything specific in that regards, but that would be certainly useful to know. And, and lastly, uh, the implementation guidance was mentioned. I would love to know a little bit more about how that's going to work and what the process is going to be and whether there's going to be any kind of uh, ability of external actors, whoever they might be, to scrutinize that implementation. Thanks. Um, so thanks, and thanks for the uh, the input. That was a great gathering that uh, that you helped put together on the Hill, bipartisan, really substantive, um, and uh, those dialogues have continued. Um, certainly, the risk conversation I think has gone extremely well when the cameras are off. Uh, I think that the question is going to be whether we're ready to have that adult conversation when the cameras are on and whether we can disaggregate some of the different elements of that. Um, but I do get the sense that uh, that, that message has gotten through and that there, that there is a desire to, to have a very serious conversation about it, and we certainly want to do that. Uh, on the authorization issue, we tended, the, the general rule that, uh, that Heather and others asked us to, to think about was largely speaking to work within the budget we had and with the authorization but not be constrained if something really needed to be raised uh, to raise it I think with the the there's not a, a tremendous amount of granularity in a lot of areas of the document that's going to play out in the implementation guidance. Our general rule was if you have to use two acronyms in a single sentence, it's probably too specific uh, when you start getting into, you know, DASs and, and COMs and the rest. So um, I think that you will see that. It's really the, the same dialogue that's already been going. Just some of those ideas that were originally in a draft that was maybe twice as long uh, will be pulled in. And I think that's rightly so. You want a strategic review to do a high-level sense of the overall directions you're going, and we, we tried to meet that standard. So it will certainly continue to be um, uh, a, a partnership with lots of stakeholders as we think about that. Uh, some of it will just gets into so much State Department ease that you know it's going to be a very limited number of folks who want to read those, but we will we will work on that together. So I think in general with the authorization issue, we certainly met with uh, staff already and many others at State and Aid have done so. Um, I think it will be very interesting to see. Uh, I think the prospects of passage are probably relatively low, but I think that the dialogue itself is going to be incredibly interesting. Um, and change, or the, the prospect of change can be scary, uh, but I think you have some really serious people uh, on the Hill on both sides that are thinking about this in ways uh, that have not been part of the debate for a while. Uh, we've tried to make available whatever findings we've had uh, uh, to them, and we think that should be a, a, you know, a partnership going forward. Implementation? So implementation, again, we're, we're working on those. It's ongoing. There are parts of our team that have already sort of shifted three or four weeks ago from the, the document language to the implementation. What we're looking at over the next five or six weeks is doing a series of events uh, at think tanks around town on some of the key themes. That's partly going to be action forcing to try to get implementation guidance together or get an, another round of inputs on those details. So I think this is sort of the, the goal of the summer. Yeah, and just to add, having lived through the implementation of the last QDDR, I think it's an excellent question because um, you're so relieved when it's done, uh, but it really is about make you know living up to the promises and the vision that's in the document and I know on our side um, you know we took it very seriously and just constantly sort of went back and said okay we said to this what did this mean and sitting down with our counterparts at State Department and how do we really deliver on it and and making adjustments I mean obviously there were things in the last QDDR we said well that was a great idea but we really can't deliver on it but let's think about how we achieve that same objective so I think there's that same level of commitment for sure this time
I'm Larry Knowles with the Hewlett Foundation, and I'll add to all the congratulations, especially on the outreach and consultation, and I just hope your colleagues are paying attention to this and maybe think of this as a model going forward on similar exercises. Um, I want to ask a question about what I didn't see in this QDDR that was in the first QDDR. And I know there's a lot of things that were in the that were not in this one that were in the first one, and thank goodness for that. Um, but this had to do uh, with the issue of a recommendation in QDDR1 around an integrated national security budget and moving, exploring and moving in that direction. Um, personally, I go back and forth of whether it's a good idea or, or not and, and see disadvantage, advantage. But setting that aside, you know, the, the uh, Alex here and you talk about defense resource allocation and how that can have an impact on what we do in development and diplomacy and so much continuation of the emphasis on the three Ds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, th th so we're in a very different in budget landscape than when the first QDDR was, was developed. Um, and, and now you're finding yourself in this weird situation where you're in the bucket with the rest of domestic programs fighting over resources and defenses in their own category with their, their strong uh, uh, congressional support for that. Um, I'm curious, during the deliberation over this, QD, this version of the QDDR, was this issue, was there any discussion about it? Should you explore it? Was it, it, it's, it was, was not worthwhile to take on? Or was there, there any consideration uh, uh, taking that up again? It was not something, again, part of that was just the nature of the fact that we knew from the beginning we were going to be looking at a very limited number of resources um, or number of issues. And I think also, as you noted, the budget environment. I mean, in some ways, the first QDDR came out in a different budget environment than it was written in, um, thanks to some of us not being good enough to get reelected. Um, <laughs> So uh, I think we were trying to operate within that. Um, so for a <laughs> yes, hi everybody. Nazani Nash with the Center for Global Development. So excited to hear about the Geek Revolution. I think any of you who know me would be able to validate how thrilled I am to hear that folks are learning more about constraints analyses. Um, but I think I'd add to that that. The constraint didn't seem to me to be whether data and analysis was available. So there are those pockets of excellence within and outside of state and USAID, as um, previous speakers have mentioned, that make that kind of data and analysis available. But the trick is who decides what data we use and what analysis we use and how we use it. And similarly, on budget flexibility, um, there's more in there than we think there is, but the big question is who gets to, to decide what we're going to stop doing to do something else and on what basis. So I wondered how you thought about sure. those kinds of questions. So um, the, uh, I, I, I actually think that we see three things together, data diagnostics, and I do think design, the third D, is really important because it's not just who decides it, but how it's communicated. Um, I mean, I'm a reasonably intelligent guy, and I can get lost pretty quickly in a mountain of data. Um, but if someone knows how to visualize that, uh, it's a big deal. We have a story of the secretary being handed materials that were data visualized in a particular way going into a meeting with a foreign head of state. And it affects how you can literally use it in traditional diplomacy. So it's, it's not not just what data is available as was raised. It's not just the what we do with that in terms of actual production of information. It's how we communicate it. And I do think they're relationships. And that's one of the things we heard very strongly at both Chiefs of Missions conference is, since we began this, is ambassadors want this information. They're just incredibly busy. They don't have time to sit on Twitter and Facebook and catch everything that's trending or to look to read through a number of private sector accounts of what's going on with youth employment uh, in a country. It's it's about how we can commute, how we can take that information um, and be able to say, look, this is why not including women in the economy directly translates into X issue of fragility, right? So the way we've thought about it, and uh, Adam Riggs is, uh, is sitting up here, he's worked with Thorne and, and um, with Deputy Secretary Hagenbottom on some of these issues in terms of the knowledge management. We've got a great team coming together. AID's really been, I think, ahead of the curve or ahead of state, I don't know where that puts it on the curve, uh, on, uh, on some of these issues in terms
terms of looking at data and diagnostics. We look at it as both a care, as a supply issue and a demand issue. Um, on the supply side, we have to have better uh, data, diagnostics, and design. On the demand side, it's partly making the product better. Um, and then in some cases, it is going to have to be a little bit more of a demand. It. You can always say, for example, we're not there yet, but in an integrated country strategy, you would never want to tell a chief of mission, you need to do what the data says. But you can say, you must engage with it. You must look at it and be able to say, okay, here's what this said. What's wrong with this so that we understand it? So it's going to be a process over time, and we're going to do it sh slow, um, partly because of budget constraints and partly because you don't want to do it the wrong way. So I think what we've seen, and, and really CSO deserves a lot of credit for being a thin end of the spear on this, humanitarian information unit as well. You have these pockets um, that have been quite good, and I think the question we're trying to do is to say, how do we get these capabilities? We know that uh, our friends and other agencies are, are ahead of this, and I think that we need for a civilian-led foreign policy to make sure that uh, states in that game. I'll just say something really quickly uh, on that, and first of all, just to apologize profusely because I have to leave uh, out right after this uh, in two minutes, and I'd like nothing more than to spend more time with all of you, but I had a, a prior engagement. Um, you know, the thing that I find in connecting back to the question about the Hill, um, what has empowered us uh, on the Hill is our own data and our own understanding which is now more available and more transparent than I think it's ever been about what gains we are making with our investments and where we aren't. You know, the thing that I always, you always hear when you go up to the hill is don't just tell us about the successes, tell us about the failures, which often seems like a gotcha trap when you then go and testify and all they focus on are the failures. And Tom has, has talked about you know not being judged by the worst dollar spent because that's not where we're going to succeed. Um, but when we go up armed with a deeper understanding based on the much more intensive approach that we take now to independent evaluation, um, it's a very, very powerful tool. And like Tom says, I mean, you can change the tone and course of a meeting in the White House or on Capitol Hill or in an in a international engagement when we go in armed with the data that we increasingly have at our fingertips. Uh, but it's uneven. Um, our use of it is uneven. Um, and improving our skills creating this entity that Tom has been a strong advocate for um, so that people in the field are spending less of their time doing the data calling and being able to reach back uh, to Washington, frankly, to get that done so they can go out and be talking to their counterparts um, in a wired world is exactly the direction that we should be going in. Angelique Young Institute for Inclusive Security. Um, again, congratulations to all of you. I'm really excited about this QDDR, much more so than the first one, which I was involved in. Um, <laughs> so I look at the, we should have t-shirts. Um, I look at the strategic priorities in this, and particularly the first two, um, preventing and mitigating conflict and violent extremism, um, but really all of them. And I wonder if you'll use the implementation strategies as an opportunity to draw more explicit linkages between national policies on women, peace, and security and the QDDR. Because I think that there are quite a few references, and I appreciate the full document, but quite frankly, as I look at the executive summary, it's a little bit light. And I think there's a lot that state and aid are doing in this area and more that could be done. And the QDDR could be a great tool for accomplishing some of those objectives. So a couple of quick things. One, I think that would make a great op-ed you could write about what's good in the QDDR and what more could be done based on those standards. I think this goes back to Alex's point is that this is a time where part of how people can inform that, whether that's through you know memos sent to us formally or informally, or getting out in the public discourse and saying, look, if you guys are serious about X in here, here's what it would mean. I find that to be a very healthy uh, part of the dialogue. We did want to be extremely clear in this that there were things that were emphasized 
emphasize in the last QDDR that we're not going to take up a lot of space in this, but it was not because they were not important, but because they continue to be important and we're on track. And certainly the uh, the key of including women and girls in everything that we do was something signaled in the executive summary in the annex. It was the second cable Secretary Kerry sent out as Secretary of State. Um, similar cyber issues, we don't spend a lot on here. They were raised in the first one. That's because we're continuing to build those capacities. So I think that's part of what uh, th this should be read in the context of. But. Just to add, I, particularly um, with preventing and mitigating violent extremism, I mean, as you know, that is a, a whole work stream coming out of the summit that both state and USAID are dedicating a tremendous amount of time with our international partners because, as we know, women and girls are not only part of uh, the solution, they are often the uh, pointy end of the spear in order s uh, for us to really, really help uh, countries make um, some real changes there. And as was pointed out earlier, either by Alex or Tom, that uh, getting back to climate, that we looked at sort of the issue of women and girls as it was it's so fundamental, as you know, with the first QDDR and obviously has changed very much the way um, we do work at USAID, that that is the um, gold standard. And that's how we have to be thinking about climate issues. The way we think about women and girls now within development is the way we have to be thinking about climate. Blair Thompson, International Center for Research on Women. This is actually a follow-up question, and it's funny that you and I sat next to each other. That was not intentional. Um, but I actually wanted to, to push back on the concept that we have fundamentally changed the way that we're doing this when it comes to gender. Um, we thank you for your consultative process. We spent two hours pulling from coalitions on gender-based violence, peace and security, girls, child marriage, sexual and reproductive health and rights, a number of issues talking about where there are concrete roadblocks to actually implementing the female empowerment and gender equality strategy and these sorts of things. The Climate Action Plan is a good example. There's zero reference to females, gender, women, girls, nothing. We're still having a hard time doing this. We talked a bit in that discussion about some operational fixes that might be have some potential. So I was curious if there was any thinking given to detailing Foreign Service officers to some of these uh, thematic areas that aren't typically where careers are made. Um, I know there was thinking about that. Can you comment on where that is process-wise? And then it's interesting to me that the financial inclusion piece is the one that stuck, which wasn't at all what we were advocating for. And I also heard it talking about, or it mentioned on the financing for development call today, um, and Tony Pippa's call. So I'm just curious. If that was the one issue the gender community didn't come forward with, why is that the one that you're focusing on here? Thanks. Uh, so I totally accept your premise that this uh, that we are far from where we need to be on this being mainstreamed and accepted in the norm. I think where we are is that we've established um, a space and advocates within the building who continue to do the work of trying to make it more um, mainstreamed and in the conscience, consciousness of everything that we're thinking about. Um, I do think we've looked at it uh, strongly. I don't know how many, whether it's referenced, but in the PVE, CVE space, it's certainly something that was a big part of the thinking around that. On the issue, uh, as I said earlier, um, we are creating greater incentives for people to go through either functional bureaus, which is where some of these issues tend to come up more, or out tours to other places where some of these things could be worked on. So that is absolutely something that uh, that we, that's actually one of the more specific things uh, that we name. So in the implementation guidance, uh, that's where now some of those suggestions are being uh, litigated out and, you know, keep pushing. Uh, so I had two questions. One just goes back to Alex's point about governance um, and building governance up in, in partner countries. So, um, uh, just, just in terms of some, some past cases, a really good way to do that is to actually have like sister cities or to have people who are actually mayors or, or have experience of governance here. Um, the A's and work with folks who would be working on governance in, in, a, in a municipality. So I'm wondering like how governance building through a municipality to a municipality might work. And then the second question was regarding, um, regarding kind of the intersection with using data. Um, and uh, and also with counter corruption and just anything else that is an operation that involves data. So I I, um, I, I should also mention I'm I'm currently the Department of Defense. Um, so so um, so 
there's a lot, so there's a lot of intelligence that's produced, and a lot, and a lot of it could be useful for things like counter corruption or counter narcotics or some of the other operations that are mentioned here, and they could be useful for a data a data centric analytical process which would provide guidance or provide direction on how to do like a counter corruption operation or, or you know even just provide you the schematics, but um, uh, like, how do you think that data could leverage existing intelligence or intelligence maybe that doesn't exist to do that? And also, do you see data as informing operations, or do you see it more more of like an internal um, uh, leadership briefing tool? Thank you. So I think when when we see, uh, and again, it's a work in progress, the issue of data diagnostics and design, I think we see it touching everything. And that's one of the reasons why currently this is being convened underneath the executive secretariat, which looks at both the operations and budget side and the policy side of the shop. It's uh, the highest ranking career position in the, in the building. Um, because you really need some of the same skill sets to answer the question on whether people are spending too much time on emails or on cables that you want to apply to the question of why, you know, are these programs working to actually get more boys and girls into primary education and into saying, okay, what, you know, what are our, what's our option set on Syria? Um, and so I think we would say kind of data informed, not data driven in these spaces. Um, and the knowledge management is its own thing, right? I mean, you, you, you know this far better than I, uh, that we're talking about a lot of different things. But what we know is we need both some actual deeper expertise, which is often either data science or design. Adam, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then you also want that combined with generalists who are looking at um, and, and, and understand how to make it useful. Um, you know, the secretary said at the last chief of mission conference, you know, Twitter is never going to replace a handshake, and I think what we want is both of those worlds. Um, you're, you think it might, but but uh, you know, assuming it doesn't, I'm just kidding. So if you go into that situation, you want to say, how is it going to be more effective once I do that handshake uh, again to 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 be used in this direction? So I think we're talking about lots of different data sets. One of the things that I would say, generally, this is me speaking, um, not necessarily the building as a whole, is that we sometimes overemphasize um, class classified or, or government held information and undervalue open source information. Um, and I think that's a dynamic and a trend that's going to continue over time. So things like crowdsourcing and open sourcing, there are, you know, what we're, what I would say with this document is not that we're going to change everyone's mind, but those people who tend to believe that are probably going to be more empowered by this document to think in the ways that we think will probably be trends going forward. Just building on that, um, out of the last QDDR, one of the things that we signaled with uh, using science, technology, and innovation was standing up the Geo Center, um, which is part of the lab. And that has been absolutely transformative. Uh, as a matter of fact, last weekend when we deployed our DART to Nepal, it was the first time our Geo Center fed directly into the DART who was going off to Nepal, Nepal with the latest data. And I think that gets to your point about really linking data for operations so that people can be making the best decisions. And as you saw in this, QDDR are for us uh, signaling the development information system, which then gets down to project level data as well as country data. You know, you have health projects in, in this part of the country. You look at the health indicators at the municipal level, getting back to your governance issue. What's going on there? If we're investing a lot of money and we're partnering in these areas and yet the health indicators continue to, to, to deteriorate in that municipality? Are there issues of governance, corruption, and whatnot? So that's the forward leaning and where we really want to go with the DIS. So Tom, I think you can sum up. I understand you are ready to uh, close this out. I want to thank on behalf of uh, USIP, but thank you all very much for the questions, for being here, for helping to make this a rich conversation, and Tom, the final word. Sure. Um, so the sub-theme or title that I wanted for this that I was told was too wonky so we weren't allowed to use it um, was From Westphalia to a Wiki World. Um, <laughs> And I think in many ways that, that all, a lot of what we're talking about is in this move from power being concentrated in hierarchies to networks, as the Secretary often says, um, as we have the push at aid and a great push over recent years to do more uh, local procurement and partnership, as we look at how to leverage this partly because of budget constraints, but also again that rise of the rest that was part of the American grand strategy all along, how do we continue to operate um, and make the most of this uh, right now? And I will end on a slightly dark note um, and, and say why I think this matters so much. Um, the world is 
full of serious threats right now. Um, we have this weird combination of best of times, worst of times, unprecedented growth of the global middle class, so many people being pulled out of extreme poverty, and yet we have these serious issues of endemic poverty, of pandemic, uh, we have issues of radical inequality in certain areas and corruption, uh, we have threats like ISIS and what it means to be uh, in those areas, particularly to be a woman or a child in those areas. When American diplomacy and development is done well, lives are saved. We can actually prevent conflicts when we do this well. And when we don't, and when state and aid are not allowed to lead in the places they are supposed to be leading, the world is not as safe of a place. We all do this because we actually believe that diplomacy and development matter. And if we believe that, if we believe that we can reduce human suffering and increase human flourishing by advancing diplomacy and development, we are talking about the tools to do that in a new century and in a very new world. And we do this because we believe in it. So this was a, a tremendous partnership with all of you throughout the buildings. It was an act of faith uh, in many ways between institutions and, and others. But I just want to say, like, we live in a world of tremendous opportunity, but also some pretty scary threats. And I think the better we do this, the better off the world is. And that's the urgency with which I want people uh, not just to read this report, uh, but to help us implement it and hold us accountable uh, to doing so. Thank you. Join me in thanking these two visitors. Well, I actually. <laughs> it was very.